1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians 7. If you're visiting with us, that black Bible that's here in front of you, you'll find it on page 133. 1 Corinthians 7. 25 through 40 is what we're studying. Now concerning virgins, I have no command of the Lord, but I give an opinion as one who by the mercy of the Lord is trustworthy. I think then that this is good in view of the present distress that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be released. Are you released from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you should marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin should marry, she has not sinned. Yet such will have trouble in this life, and I am trying to spare you. But this I say, brethren, the time has been shortened, so that from now on those who have wives should be as though they had none. And those who weep as though they do not weep. And those who rejoice as though they do not rejoice. And those who buy as though they do not possess. And those who make full use of it. Excuse me. And those who use the world as though they do not make full use of it. For the form of this world is passing away. Verse 32. But I want you to be free from concern. One who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the world. How he may please the Lord. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world how he may please his wife, and he is divided. And the woman who is unmarried, and the virgin, is concerned about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy, both in body and spirit. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And this I say for your own benefit, not to put a restraint upon you, but to promote what is seemly and undistracted devotion to the Lord. Verse 36. But if any man thinks that he is acting unbecomingly toward the, his virgin, if she should be of full age, and if it must be so, let him do what he wishes. He does not sin, let her marry. But he who stands firm in his heart, being under no constraint, but has authority over his own will, and has decided this in his own heart, and to keep his own virgin, he will do well. So then, both he who gives his own virgin in marriage does well, and he who does not give her in marriage will do better. Verse 39, a wife is bound as long as her husband lives, but if her husband is dead, she is free to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. But in my opinion, she is happier if she remains as she is, and I think that I also have the Spirit of God. In 2009, Goat Pictures and Films put out a DVD called Single, a documentary film. Here's some highlights that they gave on the website. They said this about the film Single. There are 100 million unmarried adults in America, and for the first time ever, the majority of U.S. households are headed by an unmarried person. Hmm. We marry later, divorce a lot, and live longer. But there's more to it than that. Today's life is more complex, intense, and demanding. As a result, finding and maintaining a lasting relationship has become even more challenging. The website continues. The accelerated evolution of women in the latter part of the 20th century has resulted in many more lifestyle choices for both men and women. We live in a youth-obsessed, instant gratification, attention deficit world. Our expectations of finding the perfect partner and maintaining the perfect relationship have never been higher, end quote. Singles, who are now much more open with their sex life, um, they focus on their own personal needs. Women are getting married after 30, 35 years old. The men, they say, I don't want to be tied down. Let's talk about this in the church now, okay? In the church, do we have to have a singles ministry then? 
I mean, if there's so many singles in the U.S. at this time, maybe we need to think about having a singles ministry. As a matter of fact, we had somebody visit here. It was probably about three years ago. They visited here a couple times, and then they didn't come back. Or for some reason, I, I ran into the person. And I said, hey, I haven't seen you, blah, blah, blah. The person said, oh, well, I started going to such and such church because they have a singles ministry. What do we do with this? I mean, we have these singles. Should we start a singles ministry? What's the Bible say about this? I mean, maybe because we have singles and we have young people. We have to have a youth ministry because we have all these single people. That's what we're supposed to do. What does the Bible say about this? Is it good to be single? Why is it good? Is, is it not good to be single? How do we answer this? Well, Paul addresses that. And we're looking at, again, distinct ways we can socially apply the gospel in our local church. Practically, socially apply the gospel. How does it work itself out here at First Southern? And what we're going to see this morning is a church committed to biblical contentment and change part two. We must learn to be content where God has us and then be willing to change according to biblical standards. So the same title that we used a couple weeks ago when we started in on chapter 7 on the first 24 verses. So, a church committed to biblical contentment and change. But I also want to give you a subtitle to the message. Here's the main title. Biblical contentment and change. But a subtitle for you is this. Marriage is good, but singleness is better. What we're going to see this morning from our text, what Paul's going to tell us is marriage is a good thing, but to be single, that's better. It's better to be single. To all of you who are unmarried, you must learn to be content in the marital status God has for you, embracing, if possible, singleness for God's glory because you have, you can have, complete, undistracted devotion to the Lord in ministry. There's an even longer title for you. So if you're single today, this message is for you. You learn to be content in the marital status that God has for you. And you embrace, if it's possible, singleness for God's glory. Because you can have complete, undistracted devotion to the Lord in ministry. Now, we have to understand something. What Paul is not going to say, he's not going to say the following. He's not going to say that singleness is the superior calling. Well, I'm single, so I'm awesome. He's not saying that. Nor is he going to say that um, singleness is inferior to marriage. So all you single people, oh, 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 I'm not going to have anything to do with you because I'm married. I'm better than you. He's not saying that either. So marriage is not something that's superior to singleness, nor vice versa. Is singleness superior, so to speak, to those who are married? It's like, oh, they're, they're nothing. The issue is not something that's that's evil and bad. He's not talking about that. He's saying that marriage is going to be something that's good, but if you're going to be single, it's going to be even better. Paul discussed what those who were betrothed to virgins should do. They were betrothed to virgins. Well, what should they do? And then to do what they think is right. In reference to the virgin, get married or be single. And then he lays out responsibilities of a spouse to their mate. And he talks about the freedom to marry if the spouse, husband, or dies. But he's going to say, you're going to be happier if you're single. Young men betrothed wondered if they should continue with the betrothal given their circumstances. We'll talk more about that. <clears throat> Paul is not going to be complaining about a desire for intimacy, by the way, either. We talk about that in chapter 7, verse 2 and 9. He says, because of immoralities, you should get married. And if it's better to, to get married than to, than to burn... Some singles must simply, though, learn to control their desires and their lives. They just must learn to control their desires. If you're tempted, yes, to get married, he says, but just as well, Paul's going to tell you, look, you may have those desires for intimacy, but you can control those desires and choose to be single because that's going to be better for you. There's going to be more effort and more resources to be married as opposed to being single. 
So trust God and maintain the status quo. Now, so this is for all you youth, widows, um, unmarried. This message is directed to you. Now, for all those of us who are married, that doesn't mean that it's perfect, awesome. Nap time, I can take a nap for the next 30 minutes and then come back and sing. No, don't do that. We'll throw something if you do. But also, second, those who are married, you need to do something. Because there's going to be part of this is going to be talking to you as married people, us married people. But I want you to do something. Have, uh, kind of be a two-faced person. Huh? Uh, one side of you listening to the message and what it has for you as a married person. But also, on the other side of this eye, look around. And pray for the single people that you know here at First Southern. Now, we have a few people that are out of town, not here to this morning. Okay, so understand that. But there might be somebody here that you know that might be somebody that you know that's not here presently, but you know them in this church. Pray for them. Take a moment to pray for them if they're single, because this is a message for them. But you might know somebody as well who, who's single and is not part of this church, another believer, another Christian, a, a young woman, young man, whatever. Pray for them as you're listening to this message. So that's for all of you married people. That's for us to do, okay? As I preach primarily to those of you who are youth, young people, Unmarried widows, is this for you? And we're going to start in verse 25 and in verse 40. And where we start is first Paul's judgment. It is inspired. His opinion, it's inspired. Notice how he begins. Now concerning virgins, I have no command of the Lord, but I give an opinion, or another word for that would be judgment, as one who by the mercy of the Lord is trustworthy. These are principles for us, he's going to say. Let it be guided, be guided by your conscience. The Lord did not give specific commands for single people per se when he was here on earth. But he's saying, my thoughts should be taken seriously because, he says, by God's mercy, he's trustworthy. In other words, I'm an apostle. I'm not as dumb as I look type thing, okay? What are some reasons to not get married? He's going to tell us. He's going to give us thoughts about the issue. And he's going to say, I want you to think biblically. I don't want you to think aesthetically. Think biblically, not aesthetically. What do I mean by aesthetically? Because some of the, remember we talked about this a couple weeks ago. Some of the Christian believers are saying, oh, you know, we have to withhold marriage because that's a more spiritual way, a more pure. And they're even doing that within their own marriages. They're withholding intimacy. Paul's saying, no, 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 no. I'm not talking about you being aesthetic. I'm talking about you being biblical. Okay? There's a big difference. And by the way, when he says, no, concerning virgins, I believe he meant betrothed young women. That's what I think he's talking about in the context. Some of these couples were wondering if they should follow through with these commitments of the betrothals. Some men wonder if they should go find one to marry as well. Now, should I go look for a virgin so I can marry her? Is that what you're telling me? Notice also, jump, jump over to verse 40. It's kind of couched in this. He says, but in my opinion, she's happier if she remains as she is. And look at the next part. And I think that I also have the Spirit of God. What is that all about? Why is he saying that? Isn't that kind of weird? Isn't that strange? In other words, he's saying, these are God-breathed words too. Don't just discredit what I'm saying, guys. Don't discount it. Paul is going to give pastoral directions under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They needed to decide things based upon their own conscience. He's going to give us some principles and say, okay, here's some principles for you. Here's, here's some guidelines for you guys from Scripture, God breathed, and now you have to decide in your own mind what you're going to do. And yes, he's going to say, if you get married, that's a good thing. That's, I'm glad you get married, but you know, if you're going to be single, it's going to be better. Notice also, so first, here's Paul's judgment. It's inspired. Second, notice his motive. His motive is, I want good order and undistracted devotion to the Lord. That's what he wants. That's what's motivating Paul to do this. Look at verse 35. And this I say for your own benefit, not to put a restraint upon you, but to promote what is seemly, an undistracted devotion to the Lord. Paul's God-breathed advice was motivated by his care and concern for them. I want to benefit you guys. I'm not trying to shackle you. He didn't want to restrict them, but they would give themselves to Christ. That's what he wants them to do. He wanted to profit them, not bind them. He wants them to have constant, single-minded service to Christ. That's what he wanted for them. 
I see it's so important because we would think that as Paul, does he have underlying motives? He's trying to get everybody to be single. He's trying to get everybody married. No, he's not trying to do that. He's all, look, it's going to work better for you to be married. That's a good thing. And you're going to have devotion to Christ in that way. Great. But I think you should really focus on being single because I think you really have devotion to Christ in this way. That's what I think. But you guys are going to have to decide those things on your own. And then what he's going to do, he's going to contrast the two. He's going to say, hey, here's some things with marriage. It's good, but you have to think about this stuff. But then same list, you don't really have to worry about this stuff. He's going to contrast them just a little bit and look at that. But it's important for us to see what's motivating Paul to say these things. He wants to benefit you. He's not just trying to shackle us to do something that he wants. So, having said these first two points, I want to make that clear. And he's going to contrast marriage and singleness. And his main point is this. It's good versus better, not good versus evil. Good meaning marriage, better being singleness. Not good marriage, evil is single. Okay, we have to understand, that's the main point. And you see that, verse 27, 28, and 38. The main point is good versus better, not good versus evil. He says, starting in, well, actually 26, I think, that this is good in view of the present distress. It's good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be released. If you're released from a wife, do not seek a wife. If you should marry, you cannot sin. If first should marry, she has not sinned. And when he says bound to a wife, what does he mean by that? There, he's not saying get a divorce. Remember, he's talking about virgins. So a better way to translate this would be: Are you pledged to a woman? Are you betrothed to a woman? Well, don't seek to be released. Go ahead and follow through with that. Are you free from such commitment? Are you not bound to a woman? Are you not betrothed? Then don't look for a wife. So he's answering the question now. Remember I said some of those guys are thinking, well, should I go look for a wife? He said, no, don't do that. Remain as he is, he says there in verse 26. It's good for a man to remain as he is. So regarding men betrothed to a virgin or a man thinking about finding a virgin to marry, he's saying, look, stay where you are. The pastor's going to address the single men and single women. Later on he's going to talk about widows. But here's his point. Here's the gist of it. There's nothing sinful in marriage, and there's nothing sinful in being single. There's nothing sinful in marriage, and there's nothing sinful in being single. It's not about one being evil, the other being good. One is good, marriage. The other's better, singleness. That's why he says this in verse 28. If you marry, you're not sinned. Have a virgin marriage, she's not sinned. Don't think you're doing something wrong. In verse 38, notice what he says. So then both he who gives his own virgin in marriage as well, and who does not give her in marriage, will do better. We're going to talk about what that means in verse 38, but the main point I want to get across is his principle. The one who marries does not sin, that's a good thing, but the one who does not marry, he has not sinned either. It's even better. The issue is not sin versus holy. It's good versus better. If there's control, if a single man or a single woman, unmarried man, unmarried woman, if they can control their desires and be motivated spiritually, Paul is saying, guess what? She or he has the singleness gift. You have it. So his main point, again, if I can stress this even more, it's not about good versus evil, marriage and singleness. He's going to say, it's good for you to be married, but it's better for you to be single. Now, let's look at the contrasts. There's different points he begins. Notice the first contrast. He says, marriage is going to be difficult. Singleness is easier. That's why it's better. I mean, all of us who are married, we can pretty much say, there's times in our marriage, it's difficult. It's, it's not easy. There's hard parts to it. We would all admit to that. And some, for some, it might be harder than others. For some, it might be more difficult than others. But our times within a marriage, things are difficult. Singleness, it's easier. Notice what he says in verse 26. I think that this is good in view of the present distress. It's good for a man to remain as he is. Remain in your present state. In other words, stay single. And then he says, because of the present crisis. Now, 
We're not sure exactly what Paul was talking about here. Uh, did he mean an actual event? Uh, some say there was a famine taking place there in Corinth during that time period. There was famine, a really bad famine taking place. Some people say that's what he's talking about. That's what he's referring to. We're not really sure. It's hard to say. But we can get the gist of it. If you're single, stay that way because as one writer says, quote, when high seas are raging, it's no time for changing ships. Don't think you have to go get married. In other words, marriage will add to this present distress. It will not take it away because marriage gives you more to ponder. It's just difficult. There's times when marriage is difficult. And may God use wisdom to discern the times and understand our circumstances so we would know best how to glorify him wherever he has us. We know the difficulties. Difficulties come up in life, and Paul is saying that those difficulties can be handled more easily when one is single than when one is married. So again, there's going to be difficult times with marriage. For singleness, you don't have that. It's going to be easier for you. There's another contrast. Number two, marriage is demanding. Singleness is lighter. I couldn't figure out different, uh, uh, um, the opposite words of demanding. So lighter, uh, it's cheesy, but hey, it works. Marriage is demanding. It demands more time from you. Singleness doesn't do that. It's not as demanding for you if you're single. Because you see that verse 28, because he says, the end part, yet such will have trouble in this life, and I'm trying to spare you. For widows, widowers, virgins, they get married, and that's okay. Yet, they would be spared hardship and suffering that comes with times of, of trouble and, and persecution. Maybe he's referring back to something he, he mentioned in verse 26. I'm not really sure. But whichever he means, the point is that having a family necessitates hard choices. It does. It's just more demanding. Choices that singles don't have to worry about. For those of you single, you don't have to worry about those things. There are troubles and afflictions that married people were more concerned about. Now, am I saying that's bad? No, it's not bad. There's some good things. I mean, we have to worry about it. Think about those things. That's okay. But if you single people, you don't have to worry about those things. Right? Marriage can be demanding. Singleness is not so demanding. It's light on you. Three, marriage will disappear. It's not necessarily a contrast per se with singleness, but it's going to really say marriage, and really not just marriage, everything. It's going to disappear. This world is passing away. You can write that down if you want. This world, marriage slash this world, is passing away, it's disappearing. And this is where verses 29 to 31 come in. This is how important these verses come in, how they come into play in this passage. Because he says, This I say, brethren, the times are shortened. For now, and those who have wives should be as though they had none. Those who weep as though they had, did not weep. Those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice. Those who buy as though they did not possess. What does he mean by that? What's he talking about that? If I have a wife, act like I don't have one? Is that what he's saying? The time to do God's work is short. It's coming to an end. We will face heartache. We will face struggles. They will be overwhelmed by material problems. You. Why? Because you got that person. You got that person who thinks it's their goal in life to get you to matchmake you with so and so, right? I mean, you know that. They're trying to get you. And you're like, oh, Please don't try to match. No, I'm not a match. No, please don't do that to me. <laughs> right? And you know, it's not all about getting married. For all you see, all you youth, it's not, your focus in life is not about, I got to get married. No, your focus in life is about glorifying God with who you are. Amen. That's your focus. Don't forget that. Again, it's, not, it's not saying that marriage is not good. It's good. It's fun. I love being married. I really do. I'm glad to be married. But it's not, about, not all about being married. It's all about Jesus. 
So those are the first three, and then here's a fourth one. Uh, a contrast, marriage divides our focus. Singleness is single focus. Now, really, don't, don't get me wrong here. I can be misunderstood at this point. I know I can, and, and Paul can very much so in verses 32 to 34. We have to understand something when he says this. Let me read the verses again. He says, I want to be free from concern. One who is unmarried is concerned about things of the Lord, how he pleased the Lord. One who is married is concerned about things of this world, how to please his wife. He's divided. A woman unmarried, virgin, is about things of the Lord. How she be holy both in body and spirit. One who is married is concerned about things of the world, how she may please her husband. So notice the contrast he's painting here for us again. Now, we have to understand something. First, he's not saying that taking care of a spouse is negative. <laughs> or that they cannot please the Lord. Okay? He's not saying that. Okay? It's because when I believe, when he says please the Lord, I really believe Paul is talking about ministry opportunities. I think that's his focus. Ministry opportunities. To serve and minister to others. Second, I think he's also, you have to understand, taking care of your spouse is biblical. It's godly. You can't have a deep relation with Christ and hate your spouse. That's an oxymoron. I really love Jesus, but I can't stand him. But I really love Jesus. You know, that doesn't make sense, okay? So he's not saying that. To be concerned for your wife or your husband and your children, that's right and good. You should be. A spouse who neglects your husband or his wife or whatever disobeys God's clear commands, and they misunderstand Paul here, but also they disobey other parts of Scripture as well. Okay, so I'm trying to make sure you understand what Paul's saying here. What he is saying is singles have fewer distractions for ministry. Fewer distractions for devotion to Christ. Paul preferred singleness because marriage makes life more complicated. And you can, it can distract you from devotion to Christ. Marriage brings extra cares. You have to care about your wife. You've got to put your arm around your wife. Make sure you love her and you care for her. Right there you go, Travis. Got a boy? Yeah. Married person need to think about the desires and needs of their spouse. As the virgin, the unmarried, how she can please the Lord primarily, solely. Marriage places additional obligations on the female or on the male. But if you're single, you don't have to worry about that, right? You don't have to. She or he can be devoted to the Lord in both body and soul. I want to look at that in a moment. So for a marriage person, you should please the spouse and please the Lord. Single person, just please the Lord. And we saw them divided. A portion, it's a portion of both wife and family and the Lord. Well, this is just the Lord for a single person. We have to understand something. For those of us who are married, I'm putting it in a personal way. Me as a married person, there are certain things that I cannot do. There are certain things that I will not do because I'm married. But you can do it. Because you're single. You can do this, though. You're single. Some things I just cannot do. And I will, I will not do this. But you can because you're single. Notice when he says, uh, talking about the, the virgin, the, the unmarried, the woman there in verse uh, 34, that she may be holy both in body and spirit. You see that? That is, she exclusively belongs to the Lord her God. That's, that's the idea of holiness. She belongs to him. For you ladies that are single, unmarried, Jesus is your perfect husband. Jesus is your husband. So the issue he's trying to point out to us, live in undivided devotion to the Lord in all things, and for you singles, it's going to come much easier. If, if in marriage you're going to be devoted to the Lord, that's great, so let it be. But if it's in singleness, hey, you know what? That's better. That's better. <laughs> For all you singles, you have a great, unique opportunity to devote yourself completely to the Lord in ministry and service, caring for others, and ministering to the body. Find the family you can be involved in. You can minister to them. Find some women. 
Ladies are, are single. Find some women you can minister to, who can be cared for. You men, find some other men, some other uh, males you can minister to and care for. Minister to others in that way. You want to know a farce? You, you want to know a sham? Here's a sham. You have to have a singles group at your church because they need a place to belong. That's a sham. Because what happens is you just have a bunch of singles come together and you know what it becomes? It's a dating service is what it becomes. And you can pick up on people. All right, awesome. And they're Christians. Perfect. That's what they're doing. You people, you know, are single people. You're like, yeah, I know. I went some singles group, some guy tried to pick up on me. I'm like, get out of here. You know? <laughs> get away from me. That's what it is. That's what it becomes. That's a sham. It makes no sense here. For any single people, look around. This is your ministry. This is your ministry. There's so many, many ministry opportunities. You can get connected to a family here at First Southern. Get connected to a family. If you're young, minister to the elderly. If you're older, take opportunities with the youth. You have two examples here at First Southern of people who've done this. Ellen and Judy. Ellen, who ministers to Agnes every week, she goes and sees Agnes at Red Rock Rehabilitation Center every week, practically every week. She goes out there uh, once a week, just minister, spend about four, 30, 40 minutes with her. Miss Judy, who's, who's been teaching the little kids since I've been here. It's, that's almost six years. That's what you can do. Single people, that's you. Minister. Not fitting you into some program. Forget the program. Just go minister to people. Go minister. Serve people. Care for people. You have the freedom. So is Paul teaching us to abstain from marriage? No way. No way. There's a need for moderation and a heavenly perspective of life. That's what he's doing. Set your mind on things above. He doesn't want to deny pleasure. He wants to encourage God-centeredness. In wherever we're at, in whatever place we find ourselves, married or single, he wants God-centeredness, not to try to deny us of pleasure. And actually, I think that verses 36 through 40 are really practical application for the, those who are betrothed and widows. And you can even put your single people betrothed or whatever. You can put that in that category as well. How does it practically apply itself? Practical application. First of all, those who are betrothed, if you're going to get married, it's good. Look at verse 36. If any man thinks he's acting in the company toward his virgin, she'd be a full age, must be so. Let him do what he wishes. He does not sin, let her marry. Now, that's the NAS translation. If you have an English standard version, it reads a whole lot differently. <laughs> so you have ESV, you're like, what's he reading? There's two ways you can take this verse. It can either be talking about a man, excuse me, a father with his daughter, virgin daughter. Or it can be looked at as a, a man who has his fiancée betrothed. There's two ways you can look at that. This is, could you know a father giving away his virgin daughter? Or a betrothed Christian couple who are ready to get married? My preference is the latter. I think that it should be translated the way the ESV has it. Which is, you have a, a man who has his betrothed virgin. He's ready to get married to her. There, that's what he's talking about. I think so. And notice where it says in the New American Standard, it says, if she should be of full age, you see what it says there? Another way you can translate this is like this. His passions are strong. This is where Greek comes in handy. His passions are strong. And I think that's what he's talking about here because in verse 2 of chapter 7 and verse 9, he's, he was already talking about that. He already told them, because of sexual immorality, you guys should go get married. And then he's talking to single people. Look, I'd rather you guys be single, but if you, if you can't, go get married because it's better to get married than to sit there and burn with passion. He says, that's, that's better. Don't burn in your passion and desires. So I think he means, it should be translated where it says here in the NAS, if she should be a full age, it should be translated if his passions are strong. 
And if you connect it to the previous part where he says, acting unbecomingly towards his virgin, he seems to denote the betrothed husband because of temptation. He's struggling not touching her, i.e. having intimacy. He's struggling. He's like, I'm, I'm struggling with this. Paul says, oh my goodness, man, will you just go get married? Go get married. Get out of here. But just be, remember, you got to remember what they're thinking. All the crazy, they're thinking aesthetically, oh, we're not supposed to do this. We're, we're not supposed to even have intimacy within marriage. We're supposed to abstain from that. Paul's saying, would you come off of that? Go get married, man. Gee. He should do what he wills. You're not sinning. Oh, thank you. Can we get married tomorrow? Let's do it. Okay, let's go. <laughs> go get married. It's going to keep you from being immoral, from having intimacy outside of marriage. Have it be, do it in marriage. Now, you might disagree. You might say, no, I really think he's talking about the father versus the fiance. And that's fine. But what's the main point? Look, if they decide to get married, then go ahead and do that. You're not sinning. It's not sin to get married. As you do it within the biblical standards up from God's word, if you get married, that's okay. It's good to be married. Ah. If you're single, that's better. That's better. And again, still in the context, I believe, of the one who's betrothed to this virgin. And notice what he says in verse 37. But you stand firm in his heart, and under no constraint, has authority over his own will, has sighted in his own heart to keep his own virgin. He will do well. The one who does not feel constrained to get married, he's doing right too. So he's he's betrothed. He said, "You know what? I, you know what? I'm I'm really not. I, I I can go without this. I'm okay with this." Paul favored this one because again, he's saying his total devotion will be for the Lord. Did you notice something too? Starting in verse thirty-seven, he says, "Be who stands firm in his own heart," and then it's repeated later on. He has decided this in his own heart. He says it twice, on purpose. The beginning and ending of this part, he said, he's standing firm in his heart. Why is he saying this? He's not feeling restrained to do something. It's by his own will. He's decided this in his own mind. No one is telling him, you have to do this, you have to do that. He decided this in his own heart, his own will. He wants to keep her as a virgin. I'm not going to marry her. He does well. He has the freedom to choose to not marry her. In other words, he's saying, if you're going to choose to be single, go ahead and do that. You will do well. And then verse 38, so then, both he who gives his own virgin and marriage as well, he who does not give her in marriage will do better. See the verb, or excuse me, the, the word there? It's not a verb, it's a noun. He's going to do better. One is good, the other is better. That's an adjective. So the one who marries does not sin, that's a good thing, but the one who does not marry, he has not sinned either. It's even better. It's even better. The issue is not sin versus holy. It's good versus, good versus better. If there is control. Remember, he says he's decided his own mind. He's not under constraint. He has authority over his own heart. He's not just, oh, I'm burning in passion for this girl, or the girl's, I'm burning in passion with this guy. He said, there's none of that. They are able to control their desires. If you can do that, you're motivated spiritually, then guess what? She or he has the singleness gift. Singleness would be better. So in other words, one must decide in his own mind what the Lord would have them to do. Whatever we do, we should devote ourselves to Christ. Now, I think it's interesting, though, because when he says this here in verse 37, it seems to contradict what he says in verse 27. Because in verse 27, he says, are you betrothed to a wife? Do not seek to be released. So wait, then he says that in verse 37, you can be released. So what's he doing here? Why is he doing this? Because he wants the guy to decide, to decide this in his own heart. He must be under conviction and under conscience sake. He's gonna say, you know what? Under conscience sake, under conviction, I don't think I'm gonna get married. He has to decide that in his own mind. He does not want this man to be influenced in any way, shape, or form. If you can have undivided devotion to Christ, be single, then go do it. So again, we have to understand something. 
Singleness is not the superior calling, and it is not inferior calling compared to marriage. Okay, so we have to understand what he's saying here, what he's not saying here. Now he, he ends this, closes this section off with widows. With widows, it's going to be the same thing. You're going to get married? That's good. It's the same thing. In verse 39, a wife is bound as long as her husband lives, but if her husband is dead, she's free to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. Marriage is a lifelong contract, and only God can separate this bond by death. And if he dies, she's free to marry whoever, only he must be a Christian. Very Christian. But then he says in verse 40, but in my opinion, same word that he uses in verse 25, my judgment. She is happier she remains as she is. So stay single, she'll be happier. Now he goes even farther. It's not just good versus better. It's good, happy, happier. You'll be happy when you're married. He's saying you'll be happier when you're not married, when you're single. Be happier if she stays single, free from hardship and care, devotion and total ministry. So now, I want to bring this up. From last week, I believe, in verse 39 is one of the clearest passages from Paul that tells us that death is the only thing that frees one to remarry. I believe that. But even if you disagree with me, I can still present a case that if you have divorce, as far as, as, far as Paul is concerned, it would be much better for you to remain single. It would be better for you to stay single. But for the one whose husband or wife has died, he says, look, you remarry. Just don't be unequally yoked. You'll be happy. But remember, single, the remarriage is good, but singleness will be much better for you. You'll be happier if you're single. So for you unmarried, learn to be content in the marital status God has for you. Embrace, if possible, Singleness for God's glory because you can have complete, undistracted devotion to the Lord in ministry. One more thing. And this is for all you singles. This is a word for you. Youth, young people, um, unmarried widows, widowers. I ask you a few questions. Does a concern for the Lord mark your life? Does a concern for the Lord mark your life? What ministry can you be a part of? How are you going to minister to someone here for Southern? What ways can you minister to someone here for Southern? What ministry can you begin? Which family can you minister to? Which family can you pour your life into? Which few gals? Which other females can you pour your life into? For you men, which other men can you pour your life into? Look, this is God's sovereign providence that you are single right now in your life. So live for Christ right now. Live for Christ now. Some things for us to ponder. Let's go to a time of silence and we can ponder what we've heard from God's word this morning. And then we'll continue to worship and giving.